We're going to continue on in the series that Pastor Shine and Eddie have been doing in the Gospel of Mark, and it's in Mark chapter 6. And out of that passage, I want to speak specifically about one aspect, which is a topic that is, I think, one of the most important messages for the church, because a church is so often ignorant about what we already have. Let me give you an example. I remember I um, put in uh, 30 bucks in my uh, cell phone case, and I just put it away and so forth, but um, I remember I wanted to put in gas, but I forgot that that 30 bucks was actually in there. And so I remember after many months, I was like, oh yeah, I totally remember, and I, I happened to find it, but it, during that time, uh, when I was wanting to put in gas because I was low on gas and I thought I had no money, and so it was not effective. It was not something that I could use because I didn't, although I technically had it, I didn't realize it so I could not access it. And in the same way, I think uh, the church, we don't really fully grasp and understand the authority that God has given us. And, when, and it's not something that we can just grasp with our heads, but we have to truly understand it in our hearts and actually mobilize it and exercise that authority or else you'll never come into a deep understanding of what we have. So let's actually t- uh, turn to the PowerPoint and we want to turn to that passage, okay? So Pastor Shine left off last week and he, it, it was that aspect that here in Nazareth, Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. I don't know about you, but if there's one thing that I don't want God to be amazed about me, it's my lack of faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. One of the things that I really appreciated about this past TD was just Pastor Shine praying through it, and, and the year before, we prayed for 70 people. The year before, we had 100, or, or this year, we prayed for 100. And if you think about it, it's kind of preposterous, because we know two years ago, we had 22 candidates. Then we're praying for 70. Like, you crazy? 100? This is EGTD, you know? It's not GTD. You know what I'm saying? See, and that's what we need to understand and realize is that, look, faith and reason are not dichotomies. Like, it's not mutually exclusive. God has given us reason and capabilities. Please use it, okay? Common sense, please use it. But here's the thing, if all we do is live within the limitations of what you think is reasonable, then you're going to live within the boundaries of what you can do, what you think is possible. But you add faith to that equation, and you can start to see the God of the impossible move in ways that you're kind of like, no. So then when Pastor Shine declared it, some people were like, you crazy. But we got those numbers. And that's one of the things that I'm praying for in our college ministry, and I really pray that that will be effective here in the EM ministry as well, is to have a culture of faith. Because Jesus said, to him who believes, all things are possible. And part of having that faith is understanding the authority that we have in Jesus Christ. Because when we pray for things that we already have, that becomes a very boring and drab prayer life. You know how there's that song that says, let us become more aware of your presence? And let us see the glory of your goodness. And I think that's so true. Sometimes we beg God, like, oh, God, you need to show up here and this and that. And don't get me wrong. I understand there are moments when God's presence is so thick. But God is always in me. His presence is always where I am. His love, His goodness will follow me all the days of my life. Praise the Lord. It will. It doesn't matter where I go. David's like, where can I run away from your presence, God? But everywhere I go, there is a promise from the Lord that no matter where I go, His love and His mercies will follow follow me, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We want to take a look at this passage, okay, from Mark chapter 6. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, and calling the twelve to Him, He began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent 
and they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Amen. We see a number of aspects of this passage, which, which I will touch on, but I'm going to focus on the fact that Jesus gave them authority, and they did according to what he did. They cast out unclean spirits, and they healed people in the name of Jesus. And this is not just a charismatic bent or anything like that, but truly, all things are possible in Christ. Now, he calls them, and he sends them out. Now, you've got to get this concept, context. This is the first time he's, like, sending the disciples themselves. Up to this point, they're hanging out with Jesus and being dumb and dumber, okay? Oh, I'm the greatest. No, I am. You know, and, and, and Jesus tells them, like, hey, I got to be crucified. It's like, what? I got to be crucified. He has to tell them over and over again, and even until, right, Jesus' crucifixion, they didn't believe him. That's why they all ran away. And even when the ladies were like, he's resurrected, and they're like, no, he didn't. You know, like, I mean, he told them enough times. They're doing dumb things, but here, even those dumb guys, like, Jesus sends them out two by two and gives them authority, and they start doing crazy things. So, I want to get at, um, since uh, I'm speaking to both the EM and the college, and I'm guessing the older EM people have better attention spans, Amen. Uh, and are wiser and smarter and, and, and more mature. So, so I wanted to take a look at other passages within the scriptures as well. So he sends them out two by two. Some people say that he sent them out two by two because a witness, like a testimony, Jesus, I, I mean, the God, God always talked about having two or more and, and so forth. Some people believe that it's uh, for accountability purposes, right? When you're together with somebody, it just helps. So sometimes I've gone witnessing with, you know, my students in the past. Okay, and I'm not as bold as I wish I were, but sometimes when that student is with me and there's an unsaved person or there's an unbeliever or some random person, it's like, hey, you know, let's do this because I'm like looking at the student and I'm like, okay, it's time for me to set an example, right? But it's genius. So he sends them out two by two. He tells them to take nothing because, again, we have to walk by faith and we have to depend completely upon the Lord. I wish we did missions like it describes in the scriptures these days too. And then they come back and they're so excited. Wow. Even the demons flee from us when we cast it out in your name. So we're going to take a look at the next passage. And it's the same story as Pastor Shine described uh, in the beginning of the series. Gospel of Mark is the shortest of the gospels. And sometimes Matthew and Luke take liberties to expound and give us more details. So if you look at the next slide... Jesus command, tells the disciples, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, and freely give. We hear that often, freely you receive, now freely give. We receive the grace of God freely, so we give it out. We receive his salvation, so we give it out. And these are all true. But also notice the context in which he said that. He says, you have freely received the authority to drive out demons, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to to, to cleanse those who have leprosy, so you, since you freely received it, you've got to give it away. You already have it, he's saying. It goes on in verse 13. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it, and if it's not, let the peace return to you. See, this peace, Jesus promised us, okay? And I want to be clear about what peace is, because people of the world, when they think of peace, they think of absence of conflict or strife in their lives, in the scriptures, peace, the Hebrew word shalom, means that we are complete and lacking nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want because I have shalom. He is my shepherd. And I have everything I need because he is my shepherd and my provider. So it means that someone is whole. And in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, I love that passage because that changed my prayer life. And it says that, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and God will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, sometimes we ask for small things, but God wants to bless us more than we want His blessings. 
And so we're like, God, take care of this. Oh, I'm concerned about this situation in my life. I'm concerned about my job. I'm concerned about this particular person in my life and so forth. And what God promises is not like, okay, I'll take care of that right away, right away, right away. But he says, I'm going to give you a peace that surpasses all human understanding so that your hearts could be guarded and your minds could be guarded in Christ Jesus to be able to live out whatever circumstances and life situations that we have right now. So much greater than just, oh, I take care of that situation, I take care of that situation. No, there is God's shalom that will rest upon our hearts. And he's saying, you already have that. Jesus spoke to his disciples and he said, peace I give to you, shalom. And he's saying, if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. You can give them peace or you could take it back. I don't know if you've prayed this before, but there have been times when I pray for somebody and it's like, May God's peace, shalom, rest upon you. And I kid you not, their countenance changes. And they're like, whoa, what was that? I don't know. I can't understand it myself. But there is a peace that we have. Now, whether we are aware of it or access it is the bigger issue. But we already have it. And again, if you're like me and you forgot that you put that 30 bucks in your you know, cell phone case, you can't access it, but it's there. And it's time for us to understand and realize and recognize that we have it. Let's go to the next passage and look at Gospel of Luke. In Gospel of Luke chapter 9, it actually talks about sending out the 12, but in Gospel of Luke chapter 10, he sends out the 72. The next slide on the PowerPoint, please. And so he, the 72, they go and they return with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. This is so exciting for them. It's like, whoa, this is kind of crazy. Remember when Jesus first started casting out demons in his ministry, people were like, who in the heck, who is that? Even the demons leave and tremble in his name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. They're coming back. Wow, these demons are leaving. See, this is something that we need to understand about co-laboring with Christ. Ultimately, it's relational. We all know God can do things with the snap of his finger, but God's work will not be done unless man does it. That's how he designed it. The Great Commission will not be fulfilled until the sons and daughters of God decide to obey what he says. You know, I give an illustration like this. I mean, a couple of days ago, I cleaned the house. Don't ask my wife how often I do it, but I did it. And I cleaned the whole dang thing, right? It took me hours. But that was really to clean the house. There are times when I, you know, clean the floor, mop the floor, and so forth. And um, my kids, I, I have a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter and one-and-a-half-year-old son. And uh, because they're young and dumb, um, they think cleaning is like the most fun thing ever. So I grab my mop, you know, and then we have two Swifters, one kind of longer one, one kind of shorter one. So I give my daughter the longer one, son the shorter one, and then we start, you know, doing the floor. Well, when they do it together with me, honestly, it doesn't help whatsoever. They're not at that age yet. And um, what would probably take me 10 minutes takes me 30, 40 minutes sometimes. But I really enjoy bringing out that mob when they're together with me. Why? Because it's not, the whole point isn't about cleaning the floor. Again, if it was about cleaning the floor, I would do it when they're not there. But they understand it's the time that we spend together and the joy that we have in doing something together, even if, quote, unquote, they get in my way. You got to understand how much it delights God when we become about our Father's business. And when we partner together with him and step out in faith and we do things in his name. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why is that? Because it is our faith and our trust. And when we walk by faith and not simply by what we see in the natural realm, we're starting to build our relationship with God and learning how awesome this is. I remember hearing a testimony about Pastor Rick Warren, Saddleback Church. And I know a lot of people criticize him because famous and you know I mean the arrows are gonna come but I admire him deeply 
And you know that book, 40 Days of Purpose, The Purpose Driven Life? That's a best-selling book in the history of the world outside of the Bible. He makes so much on book royalty. I remember there was a conference with him and like the CEOs of this company, and I remember scanning them and thinking, dang, those CEOs, probably you add their net worth, and it's probably not what Rick Warren made in his life. Um, and and uh, he, was tell- he was talking about how the Lord told him one day, we're going to play a game here, and you're gonna give- I'm going to give you money, and you're going to give it back. And then I'm going to give you back more. And then you're going to give it back to me. And then I, and it's going to be a game that we play. So then he gave a lot, more than he could afford. It's like, God, uh, okay, here we go. And then surely God blessed him. And then this process happened, and he said, the point, of course, wasn't money. He said, actually, he started to reverse tithe where he gave 90% and kept 10%, but then 40 days happened, uh, the purpose-driven life happened, and, and he upped it by 1% where he started giving 99% of his money away and kept 1% because that was enough for him to live on. And some of you are may, may be like, oh, imagine how much money he's had. Of course, I mean, that's not a big deal. No, but God entrusted him with that because he was faithful and he acted by faith. Even Francis Chan, you know, he was sharing a testimony before he wrote that book, Crazy Love, and he said, God, next year, I want to give a million. <laughs> and then his elders are like, and starve your kids, your family? Like, you never made anything close to that. And that's when God inspired him to write that book, Crazy Love, and he surely, he gave a million. And again, and again, it was a process And it's that relationship that we need to understand. What Rick Warren talks about that testimony is all about how much delight he had in seeing God move. He was so delighted to give. And he was so delighted to receive and to give back and to receive back. It was just this interplay. It was just so fun with God. And you see this heart in the disciples a little bit, the 72. Oh, my gosh. They come and they're so super excited. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Let's go to the next slide. And this is where I I want to talk about uh, Hosea 4, 6. It talks about God's people. And God says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. And I really believe that this applies in the New Testament church today as well. Do we have authority as a church that we don't know about or we haven't discovered or we're not using? Sometimes we see little glimpses of spiritual authority here and there. If you're like me, you kind of stumble upon it and you're like, oh, okay, I guess this is what it looks like. And so we as a church have so much authority here on earth, but we need to understand what that is and we need to exercise it. When God created Adam, he gave him dominion over all of his creation. Again, he didn't have to. God is in control, but he gave him pleasure to make Adam the one who would have dominion. And that's our original design. And even when we go to heaven, it says that we're not just going to sing kumbaya songs forever in eternity. It says that we will reign with him. God says in Revelation 3, 20 I believe, but whatever, okay. But he says it, it's there. It almost sounds blasphemous, but it's in the Bible, so it's like, whoa. It says, for those who persevere and endure, who overcome, I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne. God, is that okay? That sounds like blasphemy. But he says, that's what he desires. That's what he wants from his sons and daughters. See, this authority is for every believer. It's not just for Pastor Shine or Pastor Eddie. It's not about special people. We are so clueless when it comes to that. Sometimes there's like demonic manifestations that that happen. And I don't know why, but uh, I'm the professional. Um, and and, and they, they're like, Pastor Jim, come here, come here, come here. Pastor Jim, come here, come here, come here. Pastor Jim. Um, the last time that happened, I remember I, you know, sometimes you, you kind of get tired of it. Same person from last year and two years ago and three years ago. And I said, look, you cast it out. This girl who was tormented, okay? There were seven inside of her, okay? We cast out five, and I, and I was like, okay, these two, you cast it out. And she did. 
How did she do it? It's not about the know-how. It's really not that at all. She just cast it out in the name of Jesus. Get out in Jesus' name. I remember the first time I encountered something like that, or it wasn't the first time, but it was the first time where I had to do it. I remember it happened in this like Bible study group that I was leading, and I looked around and I was like, oh, shoot. Yeah, I have to do this one. <laughs> it's like, there's no pastor around me. What the heck? So I didn't have done this, but I don't know. The Bible, it says, to cast it out in the name of Jesus. So we did, and it left, and it was exciting. It's like, wow, this is available for me. Imagine if someone gave me the keys to a mansion and said, this is yours. Like, but I never use that key to ever open up that mansion. Then wh wh what's the point? I never get to enjoy it, right? I remember one time the, the Lord was giving me this revelation. And I want to talk about this with worship services because if we're old enough, we've been to over a thousand of them. But I remember the Lord showing me a vision one time. And it was a, a spiritual war that was going on in the midst of worship. And it's especially during times of worship where there's a greatest spiritual warfare. And sometimes even in those like really anointed worship services and you see sometimes like people uh, 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 manifesting unclean spirits or people getting healed and no one even prayed for them and such, partly because worship is about, it's not about giving a Sunday service or a tithe. It, worship is about what we love. It's about who we love. And there is a battle going on, whether you recognize it or not, for our hearts, especially during times of worship. If Jesus Christ is going to be Lord, and Satan is waging all that war against us, trying to rob us and steal our hearts and give us idols and trying to make us compromise. And that's why we need to come and pray for our worship services, for our pastors or song leaders, but especially for our own hearts. Because whether we recognize that spiritual war is happening or not, it's happening. And let me tell you, spiritual warfare, it talks about we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle, we, we do it with powers and principalities, these demonic forces here in this world. That word wrestling, that's not easy. It's not like, you know, just from a distance do it once. You know what, I, a lot of times what I've seen, some people who start to engage in spiritual warfare, they quit. Because they're like, oh, it's kind of hard. Well, when you quit, the war's still going on. The devil never rests. The war's still going on. So then when you're one of those soldiers who just kind of plop down and quit, well, all you have is defeat. But here's what bothers me. See, there's a lot of people in the church who think, okay, oh, I can't wait till I go to heaven, and that's good. But you think that while you live here on earth, that you're trudging along life, living a defeated life. Oh my gosh, this is so, oh, I can't wait until I go to heaven. But that's not what God has given us. His authority is not something in the future, but it is available for us now. And I want to also say this, humility and authority are not mutually exclusive whatsoever. I met some great leaders who are some of the most humble people I know. It's actually false humility, especially in Asian cultures, right? We mask our unbelief, and you masquerade that as humility. Unbelief is not humility. True humility builds us up and strengthens us. False humility tears us down. It's like, oh, you know, this is one of the common things you hear in the church, especially in the Korean church. Oh, oh, I'm nothing without God. Oh, I'm so nothing. I'm so worthless without God. And that's true. That is true. But here's the other aspect that you need to think about and maybe meditate on more. But you have God. So what? So now what? So, oh, I'm worth. I, yes, I get it. We are nothing without God. There's nothing in us of ourselves. I get it. But you have God. So why are you focusing on the hypothetical that's not the reality of your life? And why don't we focus on the, hype, the reality of where we stand with God? And here's the thing. I mean, they, they shared 
about uh, this year's VBS, and it, they're talking about the power of God. It's going to focus, and we're going to teach our children about the power of God. And that is awesome, because God is so powerful. But there are a lot of people in the church who say, I know God is omnipotent, I know He's in control, and so forth. But then when they look at themselves, it's like, well, I suck. Well, let me tell you something. That's really not biblical. A father is not happy about their child going, walking around being like, oh, I suck. I suck. I'm, I'm nothing. Well, God is all-powerful. Well, you're his son. We're sons and daughters of the Most High God. Well, it comes with authority. Last time I had the privilege to speak to the EM last year, I talked about the father's heart. I talked about the prodigal son, right? A story that we all know well. The father humiliating himself to run after his son, to kiss him and embrace him because he loves his son so much. But it didn't end there. He said, bring out the best robe. Bring out and put a ring on his finger and put sandals on his feet. A ring back in those days signified authority, that you are the son of the head of this household. You're not a servant. Do you think if that son tells the servant, hey, you need to do this, they're like, well, I don't want to. You can't. You have authority. It's kind of crazy, right? Because that son, he trudged back home, and he was practicing this, oh, father, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son, so could you take me in as a slave? So when the father runs after him, he, that's the first thing that comes out of his mouth, and the father completely ignores everything he said. Hey, it's time to party. Put that ring on. Put that robe. And we were naked, but he robed us in his righteousness so that we are now the righteousness of God. I don't know about you, but imagine being in that house and being a son or one of the servants. Do you think their lives will look kind of different? Absolutely. It's not that we're not servants of God, but here's the thing. As a son, imagine the life of that son, especially that son, prodigal son, right? And we know that that story is not just for us to just, I mean, but a lot of times that's us. If anything... I'm going to serve my father better than the servant. If anything, I'm going to respect him more. If anything, I'm going to love him more. There is authority being a son. My folks moved to Korea after I graduated high school. And all throughout my life, I mean, this is, no, this is not a special story. This is true for you and I. If I visit my parents and I'm hungry, I open the fridge and I eat whatever the heck I want. Because I'm a son. I don't do that at your houses, so that'd be weird. <laughs> do you know how weird and perhaps heartbreaking it would be for the parents if before I grabbed anything from the fridge, before I ate anything, I would be like, Mom, can I eat this? Mom, is it okay? Can I, can I eat this? It's like, yeah, you're my son. In 1 Corinthians 3, it says, all things are yours in Christ. Things in the present and the future, all things are yours. Everything I have, have is yours, the father said to his prodigal son's older brother, right? If my God is powerful, if he is a king, then as his son, I have authority here in this life as well. And we need to learn to exercise that authority and not use false humility to cover our unbelief in who we are in Christ. So let's go to the next slide. Here it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And you guys, this is familiar, right? The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, okay? We don't need to be a grammar whiz here. But, you know, when you use that word, therefore, a preposition like therefore, it means that something comes before that, right? Like, because of this, you go and make disciples of all nations. And Matthew 28, 18, in the next slide, what does Jesus say? Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go. That time when I spoke, I talked about John 15, 9, where Jesus says, as a father has loved me, I love you. Whoa, can I believe that? 
As God the Father loves God the Son, he loves us like that. And I gave you that wonderful revelation that because God is not like us who grow and mature and mess up and, and, and are molded, God never grows. And so today he loves you as much as he will ever love you in all of eternity right now. See, I don't want to find that out in heaven. I want to live in the midst of that right now. Wow, he loves me as he will ever love me right now. And I can walk in confidence of that as his son. Okay? But he didn't stop there. Jesus later on said, as a father has sent me, now I send you. As a father has sent Jesus, he sends us. And he's not sending us like just, hey, there you go. He's giving us his authority. You, I'm not going to go to my daughter today and be like, hey, daughter, done my best for three and a half years. You're going to learn to hack it in this world. Why? Because she can't. And Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I'm going to send you the Spirit. And it's going to be better that I leave you. It's like, what? What's better than you staying with us, Jesus? This is kind of awesome. No, it's actually better for, you, for me to go and to you receive the Spirit. And he said, you will do even greater things than these, than what I have done. And again, I mean, we know in our, I, immediately, of course, we're never going to be better than Jesus. But I think it comes from a father's heart too. Where all of us who are parents, we all want our kids to be so much better than us. So much better than us. And we're not going to be better than Jesus, but he would be more than delighted to do greater works through us than even what he did in his earthly life. I know that's kind of mind-boggling. It's one of those things that's really hard for us to take by faith. But it's doable because it's not coming from our strength anyway. It's coming from him. So he can do all things. You know, they say one of the worst things that you can do for your kid. I think a lot of Korean parents need to read that. Uh, is uh, to do everything for your kid. They said it's actually a problem when a kid doesn't have problems. It's a real, that's the real problem. They need to learn to have a problem and learn how to deal with it and live life in the midst of a non-utopian world. And Jesus told his disciples, by the way, you're going to have trouble in this world. When you are hated, remember they hated me first. Well, what kind of love is that, Jesus? See, he's actually empowering us, and he's sending us, and he wants us to do it on his own. Do you guys, I mean, let's be honest here, because this is not an uncommon trend. In fact, it's, it, it would be the exception to the rule to see the, um, well, let me put it this way. Um, isn't it true that in the church, a lot of times, the most passionate people about God are the younger people? And then the older ones are kind of like crusty and lukewarm. They live life in the real world, so you've got to be practical. And people who used to be on fire for God when they were 18 or when they were 25, you look at them when they're 40, and it's kind of like, it's kind of sad. You know why I think part of it is? It's because we're dealing with baby Christians. Now, if you're dealing with the 12-year-old junior high kid and she's a baby Christian, like there's a little bit of a, I mean, grace there. But like if we're 50 and we've been going to church all our lives and we're baby Christians still, it, it gets a little tiresome. See, God expects us to do things for ourselves as well. No, we, now, we have to do it in Him but this is something that's very important for us to understand. God will not do things that he has told us to do ourselves. So then in the scriptures, it talks about how somebody plants a seed, somebody waters it, but it is the Lord who makes him grow. And it's talking about how it is really God's power. But it doesn't end there, though. Remember, someone needs to plant that seed. Someone needs to water it. Someone needs to harvest it. I remember hearing a testimony from this pastor and it, he, he, was in a, he was in a vision, and he said he rarely ever gets it. But the Lord was teaching him things. And he's like soaking this up. God's giving him incredible revelations. 
And the next thing he sees, he sees this demon come into that vision, and this demon is yapping. So he can't hear what God is saying. And he's obviously getting really bothered in his spirit, like, I've got to catch what God is saying, but this stupid thing is there. And, and, and he, he's in the midst of this, and he's kind of like, God, like, why are you continuing to talk? Like, why don't you, like, you know, like, I mean, get rid of this thing so I can pay attention to what you're saying. And that went on for a little bit, and finally he got so exasperated, exasperated that he was like, demon, get out in Jesus' name. And it, he said it immediately plopped over, and it fell. And he said God was teaching him, and God told him, see, of course I can do it, but you have to do it. I am not going to do that for you. We can be 50 and go to church all our, all our lives and be baby Christians because we don't have a prayer life and we need Pastor Shine to lay hands and pray for us. At some point, we've got to teach our people to live it out themselves. And so when we get older and we do this boring Christianity, this lifeless, powerless, prayerless Christianity, then, I mean, you know, who can blame you for being jaded and crusty and Sunday service is not, you know, I mean, it's just another routine. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this is very important for us to understand this. Um, uh, can we get to the next slide of the PowerPoint? This is Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. The book of Ephesians has a lot to do with ecclesiology or, or what the church really is. And it talks also a lot about the authority of the church. And I don't mean church as an institution. I mean each believer and a corporate body as well. I shared last week about this kind of uh, famous short story and basically, the short story is that somehow a, an eagle's egg lands in a chicken coop, and so this eagle is hatched, and it hangs out, it, it's raised up in the midst of chickens. So he thinks he's a chicken, and he eats like a chicken does. He doesn't fly like an eagle does. He, you know, flutters like a chicken. And basically, the whole story, to make it short, is that one day, another eagle comes by, and he's like, what the heck are you doing? It's like, I don't know. It's like, dude, you're an eagle, not a chicken. And then he comes to this realization, wait, I am not a chicken. I'm an eagle. And he soars out of that coop. He doesn't eat all those chickens, though, but hey. Um, it's time for us to understand also that Jesus, not only did he say, I am the light of the world, but then he turned around to us and said, you are the light of the world. Some of us have such a low view of the church, and we have such a low view of ourselves. I've never, met, I've never read an autobiography of a, a great man who had an extremely low view of himself. There is something he believed in. And some of us think church is like this kind of entity or this or this or that. Well, we see in the scriptures that the gates of hell will never overcome the church. Why? Because the church is actually the victorious one. That's why. The enemy has no dominion over the church because this is God's people. And we need to come to understand the power of the church. That if we are lost, this nation is lost. The church is a hope of this world. We are the salt and the light. And sometimes we just do Sunday service, we just do Sunday service, and then so we don't really realize what we are made of and what we have been called to do. Go to the next slide, please. So, Apostle Paul prays this for the church. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Amen? It is not something we grasp with our intellect because it may make sense to us, oh, we have authority and so forth. You may get it in a mental level, but it does not matter if it's spirit is not in agreement with it. So that's why he's saying, I pray that you will receive spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you will know God better. Now let me tell you something. If you want breakthrough in your prayer lives, pray the prayers in the scriptures. 
This is not just something Paul prayed for some particular people in Ephesus. It's actually living for us today. So it goes on, okay, that same verse. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. This incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. This incomparably, you cannot compare to anything, great power for those who believe, which is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly Father, is ours. And again, this is good, but we got to know it in our spirits. And that's why he's praying that they will have that spirit of revelation. And then it goes on. Far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And he goes on. And God placed him, placed all things under his feet, appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. So it doesn't matter who you are. Maybe you think you're the most insignificant part of the body of Christ. Maybe Pastor Shine's like the, you know, right biceps, but you're that pinky toe. It doesn't matter where we are because we, it says that God has placed all things under Christ. Now go to the next slide, Ephesians 2, 6, okay? It says, God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. Christ Jesus, that right hand of the Father, that right hand means authority. And he's saying, we have been raised up with Christ, and we have been seated with him in the heavenly realms. That is a place of authority. So even if you're the pinky toe, everything will come underneath the feet of Jesus, so you stand over every other powers that shall bow before the name of Jesus. We need to understand that. Sometimes we talk too much about what Christ, how Christ suffered, but we don't like to talk about our suffering. How Christ died, but then we don't like to die to ourselves. How Christ was raised from the dead, well, you have to understand, we also have been baptized unto his death and resurrected with him, The same power that raised Christ from the dead is a power that lives in us, and he is now sitting in the right hand of the Father, but now we are seated in the heavenly realms with Jesus Christ. And that's a lot of power. When Christ ascended, he transferred his authority to the church. As the Father has sent me, I send you. That's our spiritual position. I know we're living right now in, in, on earth, but our spiritual position is that we are seated with him in the heavenly places. All things have been put underneath his feet, and we are seated with Christ. We will reign with him. The right hand of the throne of God is the center of power of the whole universe. It's not just a future thing. It's our position right now. We will see it in all its fullness one day. I remember reading about this particular missionary. I believe he was from Scotland. His name is John Dowie. And he lived like three centuries, three, four centuries ago. And basically, he was, I think, a Scottish guy. And he crossed the Atlantic a number of times, okay, to do missions work here in the U.S. And he uh, writes this, and he says that every time he saw the storms, he rebuked the storms. Because he saw Jesus, that's what he did. And he said, every time the storm subsided. This is not about a great man three, four centuries ago. Again, we got to read it for ourselves and hear it for ourselves. James talks how Eliza was just a man like us. But when he prayed, the heavens shut up 
and wouldn't release rain. And when he prayed again, the rain came. I know for some people of the world, this is like the most foolish talk. But you know, we're in a historic drought in California. I think, you know what I think the solution is? Yes, I understand we can't destroy the environment. I'm an environmentalist, all of that. But I think we need to pray that God will send his rain. See, you know, my daughter, I, I think uh, Pastor Daniel's wife made it very clear to me that she didn't learn it from here, okay? I think she learned it from her, the daycare that she used to go to because she's a, the lady is an amazing Christian woman. And so they teach her these Bible stories. And one day, she comes to me and she's like, explain to me what she learned. And she's like, oh, 나쁜 하나님이, 좋은 하나님. And basically what that means is the, the bad God... And the good God and so forth, and I stopped trying. It's like, uh, faith, uh, there is no bad God. He's like, oh, yes, there is. And I, I, I went back and forth for about five minutes, and I, I just gave up. But you know the reason why I say this is because I, uh, the, when I talk to people in the church, sometimes I, I get this very clear feeling that we consider Satan to be an evil version of God, and there's like this warfare going on between good and evil. Satan is not an evil God. He is a mere creation. And he is not omnipotent. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. And in fact, Jesus said, hey, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He is a defeated foe. And see, so we need to understand that we already have victory, but again, there's a part that we need to walk out. The reality is that Christ has given us victory, but now we have to exercise that victory and that authority into the realms of our lives. So let's go to the next slide. Because it's very unfortunate when some people in the church have more faith in the devil than they do in God. They have more faith in their sins than in the power of God's forgiveness. I sometimes get tired of hearing this stuff. Oh, Pastor Jim, I'm getting attacked like this week. Oh, the enemy's doing this, the enemy's doing that. We need to understand, God's word says that he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. We are no longer under the dominion of the enemy. So when people talk like that, they're giving Satan a lot of credit, too much credit. He does not have authority over me. I'm not saying he doesn't try to trip me and attack me, but he has no dominion or authority over me, so I can't be like, well, Satan made me do this or that. You know, some like, you know, like people, skills, coaches, they always talk about, hey, don't say he made me angry, say you are angry. Because then you're giving him that power to anger you, but you have to take control over your own emotions and own up and be responsible for your own emotions, right? And then in some ways, it's that. It's like, oh, the devil is like, oh, my gosh, this isn't that. No, 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 resist him. He is a prince of this world, but we are not of this world. So we are not under his government. We're under the kingdom of the sun. Go to the next slide, please. And here's a story um, of uh, Peter. It's a famous confession of Peter, right? The first time somebody says that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. So he confesses, and then Jesus replies, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. Okay? Which is an important concept. Again, it's not by flesh and blood. Our war is not against flesh and blood. You can't understand it that way, but my father gave it to you. And I tell you that you are Peter, Petros, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And then he says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Again, this is a present promise. When Jesus comes back, there will be no earth for us to bind anything or loose anything, right? 
What that's talking about is the keys, okay? Again, it's not like this, like, blank check for people to just do whatever they want and operate in the flesh. But what binding is, it means stopping the works of the enemy. We bind Satan. It says in 1 John 3, 8, Jesus came to destroy the works of Satan. To bind. But it doesn't stop there. It says, whatever you lose. Some people are really bad at spelling and they uh, spell lose like that. That's not what it is. Okay? When you lose something, you're releasing something. That's maybe the blessing of God that you're releasing. You're releasing the power of God. So you have the keys to the heaven. You have the keys to stop the enemy's works. And you have the keys to release the power of God. And he's saying, whatever you do here on earth, I will do that in heaven. He's giving them authority to exercise now. Amen? Go to the next slide, please. It says this, Colossians 2.15, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Let me bring a little bit of context of those times. Back in those days when kingdoms went to war against one another, if the, obviously the victorious side, they would return home with banners, huge banners of their, whatever, the flag of their own country to, to show off like we won. But not only did they do that, but a lot of times they would take captives and especially the leaders, right, whether it's the king of that nation or the commanders of the army, they would bring them in those like, you know, those jail cells, but then they're kind of portable like the tabernacle. And they would have these prisoners of war and they would parade them around as they return back home, making a mockery out of the defeated foe and say, we defeated that guy. And that is what it's saying here in the scriptures as well, that he paraded, he made a spectacle of the enemy. This is what Jesus did and showed us that he is a defeated foe. You know, I want to just segue a little bit and talk about that whole passage with Peter. A little bit after Peter's confession and Jesus giving him the keys, another story happens, right? And it's like Jesus is like, well, I need to be crucified, but I'm going to be resurrected from the dead and so forth. And Peter rebukes Jesus and says, that can't happen, Lord, to you. And Peter's like, get behind me, Satan. You're kind of like, Jesus, uh, that's a little harsh. Uh, and, and, and so forth. But what we need to understand here and why I'm talking about this is um, he was not calling Peter Satan. He's not building his church on Satan. He is talking to the spirit that is influencing him. And one of the ways that the enemy sometimes get a foothold over us is through people. You know, church drama that seems more unredeemed than the worldly drama. You know how sometimes people will speak a word and you're like, oh my gosh, that must be from God because I needed that or that bears testimony in my spirit. Guess what? Sometimes the enemy might influence another person in their weakness and say something to you that might really rip your heart out or hurt you or discourage you. But here's something that I learned. We need to understand this. We only have one enemy, and that's Satan and his minions. People are never our enemy. So then when someone says something hurtful or when someone says this or that, we can't give the enemy a foothold. It's actually helped me a lot in forgiving people because I realize that the enemy is trying to sway that person and trying to get a foothold into my life. And so, again, we need to see things beyond the natural realm and then, like, we feel like this person's the enemy or I mean, please don't, you know, say, oh, that person's the instrument of Satan or something. But at the same time, understand the enemy does attack us and he likes to attack us through people too. And we need to see beyond the circumstances and see the reality for what it is in, in its spiritual warfare. Okay? Go to the next slide, please. Let me zip through these. In 1 John 4.4, 4, it says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. It's not just about Jesus overcoming, but we overcome with him. Okay? It wouldn't make any sense for Jesus to overcome, but his children not to. Because the one who is in you, the living God, is greater than the one who is in the world. 
which is Satan. See, let me give you an analogy. When a police officer goes on the street and puts his hand up, all the cars stop. That's his authority. It's a little bit different from power. He's not doing it by his power because his hand versus that car, I don't like his chances. Okay? You know, they say that one of the most scary things for people is uh, when they get pulled over by a cop. You know, sir, did you know why I pulled you over? I don't know, because I sped. See your license and registration, please, you know? Because they have the authority backed by the government. I'm not necessarily scared of that person, but I just don't want to mess with the United States of America, right? I've never seen a cop come to me and be like, sir, um, if it's okay with you, could I see your license? Oh, no? Okay, never mind. I've never seen a cop standing in the street and watch the cars pass by and it's like, man, I wish those cars would stop. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's how some Christians operate because they don't exercise authority and they just accept life. They think circumstances, oh, I guess that's in the will of God and they just accept it as it is. But God is telling us that that's not the life he has for his children. He has promised his life into its abundance, its fullest, okay? And we have the name that is above every other name and we need to know and trust in the power of the name of Jesus and the authority that comes in that name. Let's go to the next slide. It says, submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. We don't have to be scared. He needs to be scared of you. He needs to be scared of us because we have the living God. I remember um, Pastor Andy, um, when we first started to meet and he asked me to disciple him and so forth, he told me, hey man, like, Every night I can't sleep. Like, why? Because I always see things. I see dark figures. I get scissor log. I can't move. Just, I just can't do it. It's like, how long has it been going on? It's like, I, I don't know. I think he said a couple of years. It's like, really? It's like, what do I do? Can you pray for me? I was like, of course I'll pray for you. So I said, but next time you see it, I mean, I'm not going to sleep over at your house every night, right? Next time you see it, rebuke it in the Jesus' name and cast it out. I said, okay. So the next day he calls me. He's like, hey, I saw it again. I rebuked it, but it didn't go away. I said, no, no, no. Sometimes it takes a little wrestling. Okay, that's the problem with some Christians. They do spiritual warfare a little bit, and they just say, oh, I don't like this, and they plop down. I said, no, rebuke it until it goes away. So the next night, he said, hey, I stayed up for like, I don't know, four hours or something, but it went away. And he said, ever since that day, and that's been years, that hasn't happened to him one time because he cast it out. And I believe the enemy is afraid to come to him because he has the authority of the name of Jesus. Just like a cop is not afraid to pull you and I over, they have the authority given to them by the government. So then some time passes, and I remember getting a call on a Friday evening. I think it was like 7.48, 7.45. It was like a little bit before I had to leave Friday night service. He gives me a call. He's like, oh, my gosh, dude. Hey, can you come to this house? It's like, why? This girl, my, my friend's girlfriend is like demonized. I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> you should see her. She's going crazy with the knife. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I really can't go because I have to lead service, but I was happy that I couldn't go. <laughs> it's like, she has a knife. Why do you want me to come? <laughs> and he's like, oh, dude, like, I, I don't know, man. I haven't done this. I've done this out of my life, but like, I haven't done it in other people. And this is kind of like a big case from the beginning. He's like, and I was like, hey, Andy, um, remember, we are a royal priesthood. We're kings, Okay. We have authority in him. We are chosen. We have been brought out of darkness into this wonderful light. And, and, and darkness needs to flee when light comes in. Just rebuke it in Jesus' name. 
right? So he, he's like, all right, man, all right. And he, of course, he tells me a story of how much he was praying and shaking as he was going there. But um, I get another call from him after the Friday night service is over. And I'm getting this call. I'm like, oh, man. I'm thinking he's like, dude, you got to come and help. And he calls me, and I answer, and he's like, dude, I rebuked that enemy in Jesus' name, and she is normal. And he, again, it was almost like those 72 who came back and reported to Jesus. He was so thrilled. And I was so thrilled I didn't have to go to that knife-wielding maniac, you know. Like, I'm like, oh, <laughs> with that call, I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to take this one. i got to do it for my friend. Uh, and, 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 and so, again, how do we exercise that authority? I'm not gonna look, I'm, I'm not going to show you all the scriptures just for time's sake and just kind of close it. But we need to speak it. It doesn't come with like, you know, when Jesus was confronted by the enemy, Jesus spoke the very words of God. In Ephesians 6, when it talks about the armor of God, his word is the one offensive weapon he, we have, which is a sword of the spirit. And we fight the enemy with the sword. It is also tells us to take up a shield of faith because of the many arrows it's powerful to, to fend off. And again, remember, the enemy may throw many arrows at us, but we have the power. Peter and John, who were confronted by the Sanhedrin, the, the high and holy people of Israel, and it says that they were so, like, surprised, shocked at how much, how bold these guys were because they were uneducated. And then when they walked to the temple and saw this lame man, they said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And this man got up and walked. In 1 John 5, 18, it says the evil one cannot harm us, again, because of where we stand with God. You know, we know that story well of David and Goliath. <laughs> Everyone looked at David and you're like, you crazy shepherd boy, get the heck out of here, right? His older brother said, what are you doing here? Get out. See, David didn't compare himself with Goliath. David compared Goliath with God. And he thought, oh, we got this. So then when he approached Goliath, and Goliath is like, what the heck? This is what you can send me, you know, out of your whole army? And what does David say? In the name of God, in the name of Yahweh. He throws his sling stone or whatever you want to call it, and he slays the enemy. We need to understand, Satan is in the business of making us look like grasshoppers and our enemies look like giants because he wants to deceive us and keep us in ignorance of our authority in Christ. He's already defeated. Now I'll close with this. I remember praying for my wife early on in our marriage and um, she was coughing, like just all night uncontrollably and she couldn't get any sleep and uh, I didn't realize that because I'm a deep sleeper but I woke up to this which is a big deal and I realized that she was suffering from this so I laid hands on her and I prayed in the name of Jesus all sickness get out I'm a fairly logical person the first time I try to rebuke those kinds of things I was like cold get out like cold is like a dog or a man like living entity but like work. There's authority in Jesus' name. So I prayed that, and she said, no, I felt like, like those mint candy kind of thing throughout my throat like crazy, and it just stopped right away, and she slept the rest of the night. Believe me, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm telling you, if God can do that through someone like me, it's fair game for everyone. It's every believer's authority because we have been seated with him in the heavenly realms and everything is placed underneath his feet. And it's time for the church to get the right picture of who we are in Christ and the authority that comes from being the son 
of the living God and to start to exercise our authority. When we see our families struggling or our, you're, you feel like your family is being ripped apart, you know how I pray? Pray in the name of Jesus. All works of the enemy upon my family be broken off in the name of Jesus. And I've seen incredible things happen. When there's other aspects in my life where maybe someone accused me and I know that that's really not true. And I bless that person, but I rebuke whatever enemy is trying to do through her. And I don't let the enemy a foothold into my life. We need to understand that the prodigal son wasn't just embraced, but he was given a ring of authority to exercise. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And we need to live knowing our identity and walking and exercising the authority that comes from being a son of God, a son of a king. An earthly king would have a lot of power, but it doesn't compare to us. Let's all rise together. I'm going to ask Pastor Daniel and the praise team to lead us into a song. Then I just want to lead us into a few prayers and we'll close uh, uh, today's service.